I'm Rachel Schwamm. I'm at Rutgers University in the Department of Human Ecology, and my research area is uh, risk energy, climate change, and human dimensions. Yeah, I always have, I have, um, my advisor was Tom Dietz, and he'd always say, oh, you know, the, the hard sciences are the natural sciences, but he says the social sciences are really the really hard sciences because you've got to deal with all these variables going on in the social world all the time. Um, but when I'm communicating about uh, my, you know, the social science or, you know, trying to ex get across a point of where there's a robust field of findings, you know, for my students, um, I try to pick kind of a couple exemplar studies, you know, that have real empirical research. Um, and it can be qualitative in the sense of I use, like, when I'm talking about, you know, it's not an accident that uh, you're more skeptical and you live in the United States. This is kind of purposeful and there's been a lot of content analysis that's been done on, you know, think tank work. So I walk them through Aaron McWright's work on think tanks and the claims they're making and when those emerged and talk to them about the sampling when you're doing content analysis and uh, the, you know, the analysis of that and that and I set up hypothesis and try to present it as aligned now, I understand that social science isn't exactly like natural science, but, you know, is aligned with um, natural science kind of, of what they understand about the scientific method, if they do understand the scientific method. Um, so I'll try when I'm teaching to, to address those issues and talk um, to give them the strongest pieces of empirical evidence that we know that this just isn't oh, all the time I see skepticism around me. No, they're very, you know, well-designed studies that demonstrate that there's, you know, that U.S. newspapers are more skeptical than other English-speaking newspapers around the world, at least at one point in time they were. Yeah. The universal findings on, you know, survey findings and of kind of representative samples of the you know, U.S. American public anyway, are telling us, I mean, that we certainly know uh, that ideological differences, so and it doesn't matter if they, if you use the measure Republican versus Democrat or conservative versus liberal or however you want to do it, um, just consistently uh, conservatives or Republicans will have higher levels of, of skepticism than, you know, Democrats or liberals. Um, so that's certainly one driver. Um, and then, you know, what's interesting about climate change from public opinion, you know, studies standpoints is often, at least uh, it used to be historically, that um, personal demographics predicted a lot. So, uh, you know, race, age, maybe um, male, female, income level, right, these kind of socio demographics. And with climate change, it's that's all kind of overwhelmed by ideology or, you know, um, those kinds of things. And so that's consistent. And then there's all kinds of other interesting findings about, um, uh, well, fairly complicating findings that I couldn't sum up in a sentence or two, but about how, you know, immediate weather or temperature are affecting, you know, really there's been, I don't know, just an outburst of 20 or 30 studies on that, right, talking about um, how the natural environment that we're in at that moment or recently uh, influences our public opinion on climate change. Women tend to be more concerned, but this is a consistent finding across uh, just most environmental risks that women, you know, women are more concerned. What role does science literacy and climate literacy, which are two different things, what role do they play in driving climate attitudes? There's a variety of findings that at least one, you know, fairly well a older study now though that had said uh, that had found that um, people who um, could identi correctly identify the causes of climate change for example were more likely to adopt the, or support the correct solutions. <laughs> as far as kind of self-assessed knowledge levels go I think you know in the kind of field I study more which tends to be a little bit different than the literacy uh, um, that knowledge either doesn't matter um, or that it, um, it interacts, that there's an interactive effect with, with ideology, right? So I was talking about this, and so you find conservatives or Republicans who have higher levels of education or higher levels of self-assessed 
um, knowledge, they say, yeah, I know a lot about climate change, actually are more likely to be um, skeptical, right? And, and the higher level of self-assessed knowledge or education on Democrats are less like, you know, far, far less likely to be skeptical. And so this points to some of the mechanisms we think that are driving um, some of this, right, around biased assimilation of information, um, and particularly, well, there's a couple of potential explanations, but biased, uh, um, you know, assimilation where people, kind of <laughs> well-educated uh, Republicans, are able to really parse through the literature to find, you know, I mean, and some of them really do kind of dig in a little bit and find things that support um, you know, they become educated consumers, but in a very kind of biased uh, way. The idea is that they're very good at finding some of uh, the information that supports their, their, our, their worldview and perspective already. Also, some, it's some things along more sociological explanations around the line of um, system, uh, system justification or the, the idea that, so somebody who's probably well-educated, Republican, um, probably has a, a certain status and that you're looking for ways to kind of uphold uh, the status quo and then there's the, the biased assimilation. So it was interesting because there was this whole session on, you know, it, uh, this morning that I sat through on kind of, you know, is it the information deficit model? This idea that if you give people information, now they're going to A, accept climate change is happening and B, make the necessary adjustments in their behavior and policy support and all these things. I think as a sociologist, you know, that's not, um, that just doesn't happen very often. But, and then I heard this, you know, this other realm where it was kind of like, this is all about ideology and this is all what's driving this. And I just thought, no, we know there are different groups of people, right? <laughs> so I think about some people that are just kind of, they're not particularly ideologically driven much in, you know, any way. Um, and they tend to, uh, um, you know, be uncertain about climate change just in the fact that they're not playing, paying very close attention and they're hearing mixed messages when, you know, it kind of comes across. And so they are kind of uncertain, right? And that's some pretty sizable segment of, you know, 20, 30 percent. And um, those, you know, some of those folks, information can be enough to push them towards, you know, that or um, even I had a teaching assistant in one of my interdisciplinary climate change classes where, uh, you know, she was, she's a chemistry major, she hadn't been paying very much attention to climate change and then she said, oh, I sat through this class and so now I don't eat meat, right, because you talked about how this drives a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and I just didn't know that before, right, and so there were people like that. There's some segment that can be, that I think having a you know, good sense of climate literacy, what's driving uh, greenhouse gas emissions, what actions are effective both uh, individually and collectively is going to help that, right? Um, and then I think there are people that that's just not going to matter <laughs> at, at all, right? And so there's kind of some hardcore skeptics that are at 10% that I'm pretty sure there's just nothing you're gonna say. Um, but you know, a lot can get done with 90% of the people <laughs> kind of carrying along. We talk a lot about reaching um, the 10%, you know, or whatever percentage it is exactly, uh, of, of skeptics, but I'm definitely um, somebody who uh, thinks, you know, it's okay to discuss that with them and you feel free to, you know, kind of carry on uh, discourse always kind of, you know, um, can civil discourse can always <laughs> can't hurt the situation, but to go in with the expectation that uh, something's going to, to change because you know these these ideologies and these uh, fundamental values that are driving this uh, by definition values are something that we see as relatively stable and consistent for people, right? And so um, you know value changes tend to happen over generations. You know it's not kind of within a person, and you know the occasional. Uh, near-death experience or something like that, right? I got cancer and it shifted the whole way, I, you know, my life and what I valued. But generally, it's very, very consistent. And so I really have turned much more towards um, my attitude about that is a lot of these actions that we should be doing to address climate change as far as mitigation um, are things we should be doing anyway for other reasons. And so I'm much more for that 10% 
it's like, all right, let's talk about energy policy and let's talk about energy, um, not independence, but security in the US. And you know, let's talk about air pollution and asthma and all kinds of other things, right? And, and economic efficiency. And these are all kinds of things in, in health and you know, whatever, uh, all kinds of other objectives that can be met with not everything, you know, it's not overlapping for all climate change policies, but for a good number of them. I often, if I'm meeting somebody just totally new and they ask me what I study, I, I say energy policy, right? <laughs> or energy and society, which are classes I teach, <laughs> you know? And, um, and then you know, if they want to talk about climate change or, or whatever, but I'll talk about energy and you know, what kinds of policies could be adopted. I often hear the comment, there's so much information, I don't know who's right, this guy or that guy. Yeah. Like, I don't know how to determine what's information and what's misinformation. How can we guide people with, or help people? It's become a really interesting and complicated issue because I've been trying to parse through this because that really is a goal of climate literacy, right? Is to let people, have people have a good understanding of what is credible science and you know what's misinformation. And so I've been thinking about how do I teach my students to do this, right? And it's really difficult when people are purposely misleading you, right? Purposely naming websites different things and making it sound very scientific. So I talk to my students about all the studies that have been done on, um, you know, the, the effort to advance, you know, the messaging around on the uncertainty of climate change. And I do that partly because it's a robust kind of uh, group of findings. But it's partly so they know that content, which is these are think tanks. <laughs> the, these, if you see these names, this is where they're coming from. And I mean, it's interesting because at least, and I have to imagine this is true with the general, uh, the general American public. Although I don't know, um, you know, when I talk to my students and I say, "Do you know what a think tank is?" Eh, you know, maybe. <laughs> and um, you know, I'm like, "Well, give a guess based on what it's saying, right?" And, um, but and then, you know, do you know what a conservative versus liberal is? And, you know, this is something we're so seeped in if we're studying it, eh, you know, maybe some more, but not a ton, right? And so then saying like, okay, this is what conservative ideology is at this point in time. It's changed over time, giving them an idea that there's a historicity and a development of this. Um, and, and the same with, you know, the uh, liberal and what that's meant in the U.S. over time. Um, and yeah, and it's different in different places, or you know. So giving them a real sense of that, and uh, and um, but getting them to so understand th that, and that people are you know giving information based on their um, goals, and uh, and um, yeah, but basically, um, and then for my students anyway, I just kind of say, and it's. It's a little unfair, but I say .org, just, you know, <laughs> get rid of it, right? Or I don't know, like, just any, I mean, it could be NRDC or it could be whatever, but I don't want it cited in my, you know, in my class. And so there are plenty of other places. Um, I encourage them uh, to go kind of directly to sources. You know, I actually give them a specific list, but I don't know how you do that on like a general public basis, right? When they're reading a newspaper and they're, you know, just seeing two names thrown out there from two organizations. That's what I always think about is like, unless they're kind of seeped in like actual, the actual politics of climate change um, knowledge and, you know, in media, which is kind of something when I was talking about, you know, advancing climate social science literacy, that's kind of, and I understand that's probably not a general, like something everybody in the U.S. is going to, to get or you're going to be teaching in high school. But, um, but that, that can help people a lot, right, to understand that this is uh, people purposefully um, being, you know, making science sound uncertain and, and these are the people <laughs> now you know, right? And I always have to tell my students, I know it sounds like I'm being crazy, like I'm saying it's a, you know, it's a conspiracy and it makes me sound crazy, right, that I'm saying it's a right-wing conspiracy. But I, and then I always look at them and say, but it's really a right-wing conspiracy, right, you know, like, and there's all this data, I mean, that's right, because there's all, and then there's all this evidence um, that shows exactly how this happened in the U.S. since, 
you know, 1990 on and or really started, you know, in the Reagan era and things, right? So, um, but I don't know exactly how, you know, uh, to give people general guidelines about, you know, assessing the credibility of this stuff. Yeah. I think it's really difficult. I actually, um, way back or a little bit back but I mean I started studying climate change when I was an undergraduate and you know at that point it was kind of things like what are where's the missing carbon sink and you know things like that and I was like oh this, inter this is interesting because it's like you start to discover there are questions out there that are a little bit unanswered right this is kind of cool um, but by the time I feel like even by the time I graduated I started to get this feeling well, they know, they know enough about climate change, right? And that was 99 or something, right? So, oh, I'm like, okay, there's, this isn't, like, this, we don't need a ton of research on this. Uh, or it's not where I need to go, right? And um, I uh, got my master's in resource economics and uh, or environmental management with a focus on resource economic policy at uh, Duke University, Nicholas School of Environment. And... When I was there, my, I did my master's project on, so I thought, okay, so there's enough science, um, but, but that seems to be the problem is, I don't know, the policymakers aren't getting it, or, you know? And so my master's was actually on looking at scientific uh, testimonies before Congress and how they communicated uncertainty and risk, right? So I went through the literature, found, you know, what are the good principles for communicating risk and uncertainty? What should you be saying to convey it properly? Um, and then, you know, give somebody a full kind of risk message and, and things like that. And then, uh, and then I went through all these testimonies and kind of scored all the scientists on, you know, how they did, right? You know, this isn't a communication problem, really, and this isn't really a science problem anymore we've got enough we know enough you know um and so that's kind of where i've been ever since is oh this is a political problem right so my questions are things like you know yet yeah, how does the how would a political system address something like this when there's entrenched interests that my session tomorrow is on long-term risk governance so how do you get people you know where when a risk is increasing how do you get them to act now to mitigate, you know, to lessen that risk in the future. And, you know, because my question is, when have we ever done that before the risk, you know? <laughs> is there any example where we've ever said, oh, this might happen in the future, we should do something, and we do something about it? Because what I've found is basically we wait for the crisis to happen, right? And there aren't very many cases when we haven't, so. That's a good question. So because something bad that I've done actually is because once I moved over, once I kind of said like, I accept the science, I believe this, I understand general mechanisms of global warming and you know how this is happening, right? You start to study other things, and so some, every once in a while I'll get some very, very hard science question that I know I should know, and I'm like, I don't know. I stop paying attention to the science, mm. <laughs> you know, like I'm not as climate literate as I should be, <laughs> or I'm a climate literate, maybe I meet those basic standards, but not much, you know, beyond that. But I mean, I generally tell people, well, it's, you know, very certain that uh, climate change is happening, that it is man-made. We know a lot about what we're doing to drive it. I tend to go to the activities that we are doing to drive it, right? So I, I think a lot about this. I talk a lot about this. So, you know, this is being we know a lot that is driven by consumption and economic activity um, and uh, particular activities, you know, um, such as our agricultural and uh, food system, our, um, our transportation systems, our you know, residential energy systems. These things uh, are driving the energy use that is driving greenhouse gas emissions, that is driving climate change, and, and we know this. So, um, and then I also will try to talk about the impacts, and I tend, I like to, I, when I teach my class, you know, um, what's of value to you, right? So what do you like doing? How, what's your life, so if I'm just meeting you, right? Like, what's your life? What do you do? Okay, so these are some of the impacts that might affect you.